in that way. Order, Senator Urquhart. Okay. Senator well, O'Neill for questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Today, 344 new cases have been reported in New South Wales, with 62 people currently in an ICU and, tragically, 34 total deaths during the current outbreak. Yesterday, an experienced respiratory physician at a Western Sydney hospital issued a stark warning that New South Wales is, and I quote, almost certainly on the precipice of a massive deterioration. Given Mr Morrison's endorsed the New South Wales decision to avoid lockdown, will he now take responsibility for the crisis facing the people of New South Wales? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And Mr President, I thank Senator O'Neill for her question. Um, and the government uh, indeed takes uh, our share of responsibility uh, for working with uh, New South Wales and the people of New South Wales uh, in what is indeed a very difficult and trying time uh, for them. Uh, we have ensured that, uh, that we support the New South Wales government through the deployment of ADF personnel uh, to assist them in relation uh, to enforcement activities and compliance activities around the lockdown that is in place. Uh, we have also provided, uh, as is common practice, additional personnel and resources uh, to assist with the contact tracing effort uh, underway in New South Wales. Uh, we have also, where possible, provided uh, additional access uh, to vaccines uh, that are in, uh, for uh, the people of New South Wales, particularly in relation to uh, targeting uh, some of those uh, parts of Sydney uh, that are facing some of the greatest stress and pressures. Uh, so, Mr President, we do recognise the need to take responsibility, to work carefully and closely uh, with New South Wales uh, through these very difficult, through these very difficult Order. times. Order. We know these are trying and difficult times. Uh, across the nation, uh, we are seeking to ensure the continued growth uh, in the vaccine rollout occurs and occurs successfully. And, I welcome the fact that in the past 24 hours, some 255,964 doses have been administered, uh, yet another daily record uh, demonstrating the gathering pace in relation to that vaccine rollout, which is now seeing, on a weekly basis, Order. doses administered uh, for roughly the entire population of Adelaide across the country every single week. And that's with difficulties the rollout has faced. Uh, but we are overcoming those and seeing Order. very clearly its Order, growth Senator and success. Birmingham. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. The Western Sydney doctor also asked, and I quote, New South Wales is suffering from a conspicuous failure of leadership. Are we trying to lock down to eliminate COVID or are we attempting to vaccinate our way out of this pandemic? Why has Mr Morrison left more than 6 million Australians currently in lockdown in New South Wales, without a clear plan out of this current crisis. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, the government uh, has been working, as I said, carefully with New South Wales in relation to providing them support, encouraging them at times to accept support uh, in relation to the application of the current lockdown and ensuring its success. In terms of the pathway, out of crisis. Uh, we have also, for the nation, uh, developed the work that's been released uh, by the Doherty Institute, the type of modelling and work uh, that is world leading in terms of identifying how it is we can ensure that as the vaccine rollout continues to progress across the country, uh, we have informed evidence-based approaches uh, to be able to reduce the scale, scope or necessity of lockdowns in the future. That is, that is a crucially important piece of work uh, to inform us against the Delta strain and the enormous additional challenges that that Delta strain poses Order. in New South Wales as it does Order. in many Senator other parts Birmingham. of the world. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Khalil from Bankstown tragically lost his parents, 82-year-old Korkab and 88-year-old Hashem, to COVID-19 in the same week. His family's bereavement 
was amplified when they found out that his parents died still waiting to get their vaccinations. People have paid with their lives for Mr Morrison's failure to secure enough vaccines. Isn't it painfully Order. clear that it was always the a question race? has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President, and uh, and clearly, um, I extend my sympathies, the government its sympathies to uh, Khalil and uh, and his family, and indeed uh, all those who have suffered bereavements in Australia, uh, 944 uh, through the course of the pandemic, uh, and of course uh, the many millions across the rest of the globe. Uh, and those comparisons do remain important. In Australia, uh, though each of those deaths and each of the challenges of COVID is a tragedy is a tragedy, uh, has managed the pandemic still far better than the rest of the world. In terms of access, in term, well, I, I hear you saying they were waiting for vaccines. I, I, I do Order. note, Mr President, that more than 80 per cent of those over the age of 70 have received their first vaccine. The majority of those have received their second dose. Uh, those over 70 have been in the priority cohort and vaccines are available clearly for those Order. over 70 Order. with more than 80 per cent. Time for the more than 80 per cent. So I, I was calling senators to order. Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. I was calling senators to order for multiple purposes, including interjections. Senator Scar. Um, Mr President, my question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Can the Attorney General advise the Senate how the Liberals and Nationals government is equipping our law enforcement and security agencies with the resources they need to keep Australians safe from violent extremism. The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Scar for the question. And I do acknowledge his uh, keen interest uh, in keeping Australians safe and national security. Uh, Mr. President, without a doubt, a fundamental responsibility of the Morrison government is to keep Australians safe and to protect our way of life, our freedoms, and our values. We may be in the middle of a global pandemic, but the threat of terrorism, as we know, remains in Australia, as it does in other places around the world. Since the national terrorism threat was raised to probable in September 2014, there have been nine attacks and 21 major disruption operations in response to imminent attacks that were being planned on Australians. There have been 138 people charged as a result of 66 counter-terrorism operations since 2014. And there are currently 34 people before the courts for terrorism-related offences. To respond to these threats, the Morrison government has now passed 22 tranches of national security legislation. As I said, a fundamental responsibility of the Morrison government is to keep Australians safe. Mr President, this legislation is helping provide security agencies tools and the legal framework necessary to protect Australia, but also to combat new attempts and methods of violent Order. extremism. Mr President, we've legislated to better protect Australians in a number of ways, including to create a presumption against bail and parole for persons who have demonstrated support for or links to terrorist activity, but to also enable the continued detention of high-risk terrorists. Mr President, we take our responsibility to the Australian people seriously. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. With Australians spending more time than ever online during the COVID-19 pandemic, what steps has the government taken to fight violent extremism and the risk of terrorism online and keep Australians safe? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as we saw through Operation Ironside, organised crime and terrorist organisations are getting more sophisticated in their use of technology in their attempts to harm Australians. Over 95 per cent of the Australian security intelligence organisation's most dangerous counter-terrorism targets they use encrypted communications. The Morrison government has bolstered our security agencies with increased funding to continue current operations, but also to expand operations to keep finding and fighting extremism 
online. We've also updated our legislative framework with such legislation as the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Act, Assistance and Access 2018. And what this has done is provide the appropriate powers to our security agencies to capture criminals and to stop the spread of extremist material online as technology develops. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the increased investment from the government in our law enforcement and security agencies helping to keep Australia and Australians safe from emerging threats? Senator Cash. Mr President, the digital world is now the new frontier that organised crime, terrorist and state-sponsored actors are using to threaten Australia and to threaten our way of life. As a result, the government is investing over $1.67 billion through our Cyber Security Strategy 2020 to position Australia to meet the evolving threats but also to improve capabilities to identify and disrupt cyber security threats. As a government, we've also provided an additional $51.8 million to the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission to combat emerging threats from organised and transnational crime through improved collection, assessment and dissemination of intelligence for law enforcement agencies across Australia. These investments will help us to deal with emerging threats from a connected and digital Australia and at the same time protect our way of life. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. More than two months ago, ATAGI and the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists recommended that Pfizer be offered to pregnant women at any stage in their pregnancy. Why did it take the Morrison government a further six weeks to include pregnant women as a priority in the vaccine rollout and a further two weeks to update the National Vaccine Eligibility Checker? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, all the way through the pandemic, the government has continued to closely follow the health advice provided to us by the HPPC, by the TGA, and by ATAPI, Mr. President. And so, as those pieces of advice have been made available, we've incorporated those pieces of advice into the vaccine rollout. Uh, and that's what we'll continue to do, Mr. President. We have continued to work methodically through the expansion of the vaccination program to ensure that people who need a vaccine uh, are able to get one as soon as possible, but also to incorporate into to incorporate into the vaccine program, the vaccination program, uh, the appropriate advice coming from the health officials that support us, Mr. President. So we've continued to do order, that at Senator the first Colbeck. opportunity. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We have left uh, this point of order for a minute because I understand the minister was talking generally. It was a specific question, not about expansion generally, but about the eligibility of pregnant women. And I would ask the minister to be directly relevant to that part, that question. Um, I've let you restate the question. The way I heard the minister's answer, he was talking about advice received from various health bodies and incorporating it into a government program. I do not believe that is not directly relevant. I've allowed you to restate the point of the question. There's an opportunity to debate the merit of answers after question time, but I believe the minister is being directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And the government will continue to methodically and in accordance with the health advice received from those advising the government, continue to update the advice provided to Australians in support of them achieve, receiving a vaccine, Mr. President. We know that the, the vaccination program has been worked uh, initially based on cohorts, uh, and then there was a decision made through a national cabinet to uh, change that process to work based on age demographics rather than specific cohorts within the community, Mr. President. So we have at all times methodically followed the health advice and we will continue to do that in support of giving every Australian 
who wants a vaccine the opportunity to have one by the end of this year. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Katrina, who is due to give birth in less than two weeks at Blacktown Hospital in the epicentre of the Sydney outbreak, has been unable to secure an appointment. How many pregnant women in New South Wales have been denied access to vaccines as a result of the Morrison government's failure to secure enough supplies? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say I don't accept the characterisation uh, of the question put on it by Senator McAllister. Uh, we have uh, been very, very open with the Australian people. We've published the supply data for vaccines to demonstrate the availability of vaccine that would be coming into this country uh, to support the vaccination rollout. We've been very, very open with people. We have opened the vaccination program to various age cohorts progressively as supply has enabled us to do that. And we've done that progressively and in cooperation with the states, Mr. President. So I don't accept that people have been denied access to a vaccine. Uh, we have continued to develop and grow the rollout. We've been very transparent with Australians by publishing the supply data so they could understand the availability of vaccines as they came into the country and the vaccination program rolled out and continues to set records every day. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. One 34-year-old pregnant woman who was unable to be vaccinated due to a shortage of supplies asked this, and I quote, what's the point of adding us to 1B of the rollout if you don't have vaccines for us anyway? What does the minister have to say to Australian women who have been left at increased risk of severe illness and complications for their babies because Mr Morrison failed to secure enough supplies? Senator Colbeck. The government hasn't failed to secure enough supplies. There are plenty of supplies that will be coming into this country to enable everyone who wants a vaccine to access one by the end of the year, Mr President. And we've been completely transparent with the Australian people order. with respect to the supply order. projections for vaccines order. as Senator they come Colbeck, into the country. Please, I'll, I'll ask you to stop, Senator Colbeck. I can't hear a word you're saying. Order across the chamber. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. We've been ex we've been completely transparent with the Australian people with respect to supply. We have published the supply projections for vaccine uh, so that people understand which vaccines are coming into the country and when they're coming into the country. So, Mr. President, the Labor Party can play its games. It can attempt to undermine the vaccine rollout. It can attempt to Order. undermine confidence in the vaccine Order. rollout, as it has consistently done, Mr. President. But we will continue to provide opportunities in an increasing sense for Australians to both access physically a vaccine through uh, the, the number of Senator outlets Colbert, and also time for the, the answer supply. has expired. Senator Small. President, and my question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. On the day that Australia's leading tech companies have come together to launch the Tech Council of Australia, can the Minister update the Senate on recently published jobs figures in Australia's digital economy sector? The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. I thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Small for this very timely and important question. Mr President, today I was very pleased to welcome the launch of the Tech Council. This is a new advocacy group promoting the growth of Australia's digital economy and seeking to attract investment to Australia and create jobs across a range of critical Australian industries. The new body is backed by leaders in the Australian tech sector, including Atlassian, Afterpay, Canva and Safety Culture, as well as tech investors such as Blackbird and Squarepeg, and on top of that, also multinationals such as Microsoft and Google. Mr President, today's launch was accompanied by the release of a study that was commissioned by the Tech Council and undertaken by Accenture that highlights that our tech sector is now the third biggest industry by value in Australia. The report also finds uh, it's also the seventh biggest employer in Australia with 861,000 workers, and that's one in 16 Australians, employed in the industry. 
The report also finds that the sector generates $167 billion in output in the financial year 21, and the growth in this sector is only going to accelerate. Since 2005, tech sector jobs have grown by 66 per cent, compared to an average jobs growth of 27 per cent across the economy, and the tech sector generated 65,000 jobs during the pandemic alone. The Morrison government is ambitious for Australia's economic future and is committed to supporting and accelerating this growth. We are a government keen to meet the demands and take advantage of the opportunities presented by the digital economy. And that's why we welcome the collaboration with the tech sector to meet the Tech Council's ambitious goal of one million tech-related jobs by 2025. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, how is the Morrison government supporting job creation in the digital economy sector as just one part of our economic recovery from COVID-19? Senator Hume. Mr President, the Morrison government is backing the tech sector with $2 billion in support invested in the last two budgets alone, and that includes $1.2 billion in the digital economy strategy, which I launched with the Prime Minister in May of this year. Now, this strategy is economy-wide, and it's investing to create jobs and grow technologies like artificial intelligence and quantum computing. And importantly, the strategy invests in Australian skills. It invests in empowering Australian small and medium enterprises to grasp the nettle, to upskill their staff and to digitise their businesses in order to boost productivity and to lower costs. Mr President, with tax incentives to boost target areas of strength, such as the digital, digital games developments, and working in concert with global talent acquisition, we expect Australia to be a premier place to grow and invest in digital technology, all creating jobs and opportunities for the future of all Australians. Senator Small, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is this jobs growth reflected more broadly in the Australian economy? Senator Hume. I thank you again, Mr President. Well, getting Australians into jobs is clearly a consistent focus of the Morrison government and has been especially so in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. In June, the unemployment rate fell to 4.9 per cent, and that was down from 5.1 per cent in May. And this was the eighth consecutive fall in the unemployment rate and its lowest rate in more than a decade. Now, we on this side of the chamber know that it is an extremely challenging time at present with so many people across the country in lockdown, including in my home state of Victoria. And thousands of Australians are relying on digital technology to keep working, keep learning and keep connected to the people that they love. Alongside the economic support delivered by the Morrison government, technology has made it possible for Australians to manage and maintain their lives and livelihoods during the pandemic. And when we get to the other side, the Morrison government's $1.2 billion investment in our digital future will keep our economy strong Order, and create Senator the jobs Hume, for the future. The answer has expired. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Colbeck, representing the Minister for Health, and relates to the vaccine rollout and booster shots. I asked a series of questions on notice to the Health Minister in June, but as of right now, the answers remain outstanding. I have a constituent who advised me that they received a first shot of AstraZeneca and a second shot of Pfizer vaccine. However, their Medicare immunisation statement notes, and I quote, this individual has not received or required COVID-19 vaccines, which is untrue. He decided to get a second dose of AstraZeneca, which means he now has had three COVID shots to force a correction in his immunisation record. Minister, why can an individual's vaccination status be recorded as incomplete when in fact it is not? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, and I would be very happy to take specific details of uh, the constituent case so that I can understand the details of that and provide that information back to the Chamber uh, if that um, uh, suits Senator Griff. I'd be very, very pleased to do that, Mr President. Uh, I suspect that where this lies in respect of having two doses of vaccine of different types of vaccine. Uh, it, it may very well be that the system currently doesn't recognise uh, that as a full vaccination program, given that there is no registration, nor has there been any uh, application for registration to use 
uh, vaccines of different types to complete a vaccination program. So in Australia, uh, there, there is no recognised uh, or TGA approved process to administer vaccines of different types. The accepted methodology under the TGA approvals is that you receive either AstraZeneca with two doses at the uh, supported interval or two doses of Pfizer at the supported interval. Uh, and once Moderna comes onto the market, that will be recognised uh, in a similar way, Mr. President. But, there, but to be recognised as a full vaccination uh, in Australia, it has to be done in accordance with the approval process established by the TGA. Uh, and there has been neither to recognise vaccinations of different types to complete a vaccination, nor an approval to do so. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Minister, there are instances where doctors have switched vaccine types due to a significant reaction with the first vaccine. Indeed, Atagi a, a actually advises it in that particular instance. So are you saying that this should not be permitted or is not currently permitted and the individual must get a unnecessary third dose, which is a potential risk to their health uh, from a vaccine reaction? Uh, Senator Colbert. Thanks, thanks, Senator Griff. Thanks, Senator Griff. Look, I, I, I think for proper completeness, I should take the detail of your question on notice. I'm very happy to bring back to you into the chamber specifics. But as I have said to you at this point, Mr. President, um, there is no approval for cross utilisation of vaccines in Australia. For that to occur, Mr. President, there would have to be an application by one of the companies to do so and an approval by the TGA for that to occur. Neither of those circumstances have at this point in time occurred. So, Mr. President, so uh, I, I'm happy to take the question on notice, Mr. President, and if necessary, I can organise a briefing with. Um, the Senator Griff with the TGA and the Department Order. to give him more detail. Order, Senator O'Neill. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Well, thank you, Minister, for undertaking to do that. I look forward to uh, further um, uh, advice from you. Now, the government has announced it's setting aside a portion of the Moderna vaccine for a booster program, but the numbers your government have, has advised to date won't be enough to cover the eligible population. What else is the government doing to ensure Australia will have sufficient booster vaccines available? And you may like to put this on notice. Does the department have a problem with mixing booster vaccine types? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it's not a matter of what the department has an issue with. It's a matter of what is approved through the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which approves the use of vaccines in this country. And that process is supported by the data uh, that goes along with the registration process, Mr. President. So, uh, as as we've as the government has indicated, uh, some of the Moderna doses have been set aside for possible use as boosters. Uh, I am aware, the government is aware, that other of the vaccine companies are also working on variants of their vaccine, um, potentially for use as booster doses. Uh, and some of the orders that we have in hand can be could be utilised for that purpose, Mr. President. So, uh, as we have done all along, uh, and as the virus has changed, uh, we have continued Order, to Senator change Colbert, our approach the to meet the requirements expired. of the vaccine rollout. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please advise the Senate how the Liberal and National Government is helping people with a disability access support services and ensure that they can receive up-to-date advice as we continue to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question um, on this really important issue. We know that timely information and support is absolutely essential for Australians who live with disability, but no, no more so than it is now as we navigate the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. The disability community is 
particularly diverse and finding information about policies and programs and supports that are available for individuals can be quite a challenge. And a lack of access to this information can also be a barrier to people being able to access the community and independence and their participation. Uh, and we recognise um, this and to, in response to that, the Morrison-Joyce government has invested in the National Disability Gateway. And we've worked extensively with people uh, with disability in the disability sector to design a fit-for-purpose tool to make sure that Australians who live with disability have easy access to information and referral services. Importantly, we've re relied on the advice of people in the field, with those with lived experience of disability and those who care and advocate for them. The Gateway will assist people with disability uh, and their families and carers to find, use this trusted information through a website, a 1800 number and social media channels. It's a tool with information on advice on support from programs that range from education and health to housing and transport. It will be the central starting point for people with disability to be able to access the information and services that they need. It's fast, it's easy to use, it offers a range of accessible features, for example, easy read toggle on every single page of the website. Um, so whether it be um, locating advocacy services, finding a sporting team to become involved with, identifying a local disability related event, the tool is there to assist everyone. And importantly, the gateway is for all Australians with disability, regardless of who they are or where they live. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister update the Senate on how the government is ensuring that the disability community is actually aware of this service? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, currently there is a national campaign being rolled out across the screens to encourage Australians with disability, their families and their carers uh, to interact with the new gateway. The tagline of the national campaign is, I can. Um, and what's so great about the campaign is that the ads are actually presented by people with disability. And they, ra they represent the range of different disabilities, both visible and invisible, demonstrating that there is a huge diversity of different people in the disability community. And, and importantly, they know from their own experience what a trusted service is all about. They understand what it is that they need and will genuinely understand what will make a difference to their lives. The campaigns run across a whole heap of media, radio, print advertisements and social media, and throughout the, uh, the Paralympics we'll be running a TV campaign as well. Already we've seen a huge increase in the number of hits on the Gateway as a result of this campaign. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How does the Disability Gateway support the new national disability strategy? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr President. Well, our government is absolutely committed to the National Disability Gateway because we believed, um, in response to the collective views of the disability community who said that information about programs and services was often difficult to find and equally difficult to navigate. So the Gateway forms part of the government's investment in the new disab National Disability Strategy, where all governments, Commonwealth, state and territories, have committed to a national approach to building inclusion for all Australians who live with disability. There are an estimated 4.4 million people with disability across Australia, all with diverse and varying needs, and the Gateway is designed to reach all of them, their families and the wider community. The website and the phone line is a central starting point for people to, to help people with disability, their carers, friends and family access services in their particular area and will help drive real improvements in their lives. The national campaign has also been designed to make sure that access is available to everyone. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. Minister, the current target for reducing over-imprisonment of black kids of 30 per cent and adults of 15 per cent won't deliver parity between black and white on imprisonment rates until 2093. Is the government serious about not locking up black people before we die? Because we'll all be dead by 2093. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Thorpe for her question and, uh, and her participation, along with that of uh, many other senators uh, this morning in the, uh, in the statements acknowledging uh, the Closing the Gap uh, statement made and the implementation plan uh, for the new approach to uh, the targets in relation to uh, the Closing the Gap program. Um, I did reference in, uh, in my remarks uh, in that debate this morning uh, some of the new targets in relation to uh, justice within the uh, Closing the Gap uh, targets that have been developed uh, alongside the Coalition of the Peaks, State and Territory Governments and the Australian uh, Local Government Association. Uh, those targets uh, that I referenced, which, uh, which you have quoted uh, Senator Thorpe, uh, are targets uh, set out uh, through until 2030. Uh, for, uh, for reduction in relation, to, um, uh, in relation to the proportion of Indigenous Australians incarcerated. Uh, it should not be uh, extrapolated uh, that the reduction sought through to 2030 would be uh, a linear uh, uh, rate of reduction into the future. Uh, it would absolutely be the government's hope, as I'm sure it is the hope of every state and territory government, uh, as I am confident it is the hope of the Coalition of the Peaks, uh, and I know, uh, certainly from your question, Senator Thorpe, uh, that it is your hope that we could and should strive to do even better than those targets 2030 and to see the rate of reduction uh, and equivalence achieved in relation to incarceration rates uh, achieved at a much faster rate beyond 2030 than what can be achieved uh, within that next eight-year period. Uh, we're serious about the investment in the programs there. We're serious about the fact that by setting uh, targets at a state and territory level as well, it enables them to be held to account uh, and the reporting mechanisms enables everyone to focus in future years on what is working uh, to drive those rates down Order, even further Senator into Birmingham. the future. Senator Thorpe, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, President. Minister, your Minister, your Minister for Indigenous Australians has said that a 2093 parity date on the imprisonment of our people will hinder progress. You say you are co-designing with blackfellas. Why didn't you listen to those blackfellas that asked you to increase the justice targets? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, as I said in uh, in the primary question, um, you know, we don't accept the idea uh, that the target for parity in any way sits that far into the future. Um, what we have outlined is the target for 2030 uh, and reduction rates that we seek to achieve by 2030. Uh, now, uh, that is uh, very important that the Justice Policy Partnership, uh, with some $7.6 million of funding, uh, the work in relation uh, to preventing harm in Australian prisons and other places of detention, uh, other funding in relation to support for criminal justice reform and particularly the work of coronial inquiries, uh, as well as family dispute resolution mechanisms, all measures uh, that we have invested in following consultation and engagement with communities are about making sure we drive those rates down towards parity. We would all wish that it can be done faster, uh, Mr President, uh, and we will be striving uh, to exceed those targets and, as I said, certainly expect to see the rates uh, of reduction Order. increase beyond Senator 2030 Birmingham. as a result of that Senator focus on evidence-based policy. Final supplementary question. Thank you, and we've only been waiting over 200 years, so what's the hurry? Uh, our people who have been managing our own affairs for thousands of years must be in charge of our own destiny. Minister, will your government support a treaty, the very thing that our people have been marching for and fighting for for decades? Will the Morrison government support a treaty? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, it's not the policy of our government to, uh, to uh, implement uh, a treaty, um, but it certainly is the policy of our government uh, to work as closely as possible, uh, recognising the crucial role of the co-design principles that uh, the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Mr Wyatt, uh, brought to this approach around closing the gap uh, and this new approach in terms of uh, having designed uh, those targets in conjunction with um, uh, the Coalition of the Peaks, uh, seeking to engage Indigenous Australians at every step uh, of that design approach and seeking to engage in relation to the implementation plan 
and the priorities the more than $1 billion of new measures there. And crucially, having the states and territories setting their own targets as well, to which they will be held to account, to which there are review mechanisms in place, enables us not just to see a national picture, uh, but also to ensure all levels of government are working towards achieving the improved outcomes that Order, we seek. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator Patrick. President, um, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care uh, and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. One of the uh, three aged care facilities in Wyala operated by Kindred Living, Annie Lockwood Court Hostel, will close. The announcement came at short notice and the facility will close on the 27th of August. That's 16 days away, leaving, as I understand it, at least 20 residents either living outside of Wyala or stranded. Can the minister provide the chamber with an understanding of what the situation is with the Annie Lockwood Court Hostel. Minister for Aged Care Services and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, and can I uh, thank Senator Patrick for the advice of the topic of his question. Mr President, as uh, Senator Patrick has indicated, uh, the Operators of Annie Lockwood House in Wyala have indicated that they intend to close the facility and they've set uh, a closing date of the 26th of August, Mr President. Uh, the government has been working closely with the operators of uh, Annie Lockwood House, Kindred Living at Wyala, for a considerable period of time. And Senator Patrick would rec recollect the issues that were that came to light last year with respect to um, some uh, the care of residents within Annie Lock Lockwood House, uh, and a notice to agree was applied to the facility at that point in time, and that notice to agree remains in, in place, Mr. President. Uh, we have um, dedicated staff to work exclusively with the um, with the facility. Uh, and the facility has dedicated staff appointed to work with the residents and their families to provide suitable alternative accommodation. Mr President, uh, Kindred Living is aware of their responsibilities to maintain care for the residents, so it's not necessarily a matter of the facility closing on the 26th of uh, August, uh, but Kindred Living are required under the Act to support residents to identify uh, alternative suitable accommodation uh, or continue to care for them. Mr President, I've been working alongside the South Australian Government to ensure that there is capacity for the service to provide Order, care. Senator Colbeck. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question? Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, uh, Minister, I'd like to know what options the Government is considering in relation to Annie Lockwood to ensure that the facility, for example, remains open or the residents remain in Wyala. Uh, other options are COVID surge for staff, those sorts of things. What, have, what has been considered? What are the potential remedies? Senator Colbeck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Patrick. Mr. Senator, uh, Mr. President, the decision to retain the facility as an operating facility is one for the provider, Kindred Living. Uh, but what the government has done to support them is to provide uh, additional workforce capacity in circumstances where they haven't been able to uh, maintain that themselves. We've been working with the South Australian government uh, and uh, to, to look at what strategies there are to support residents in the short term, but to ensure capacity of supply of aged care services in the medium term. Uh, we've provided surge workforce to the facility so that they can uh, maintain the capacity that they're looking for. And there will be a weekly meeting between uh, the Federal Department of Health, the State Department of Health and Kindred Living to continue to work through the options for both the short term and medium long term Order. in provision Senator of services Colbeck. in, in Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, to the Minister, there has been uh, reports of difficulties uh, with the finances across the three facilities uh, and indeed sanctions applied to the facilities. 
Will the government consider exercising its powers under section 63J to revoke the provider's approval and have others uh, potentially take over uh, the facilities or indeed for the Commonwealth to take over the facilities, even if that might be just for the short term? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, Senator Patrick is correct that there has been regulatory action that's been taken against the uh, service because the government's first priority is to ensure the quality of care for residents within the service. Uh, we are not contemplating taking over the service ourselves. We've had conversations with the South Australian government, as I've indicated, with respect to what the options might be there. I'm aware that there are discussions between Kindred Living and another party with respect to the possible sale of the service, Mr. President. So we continue to work with Kindred Living uh, and where possible, we will support uh, those processes, as I've said, to ensure that there is capacity, appropriate capacity for the delivery of aged care services within Wyala. Uh, we want people to be able to age in the communities where they live. Uh, and so we're, we're discussing with the South Australian government and Kindred Living Services the options to ensure that that can be the Order, case. Senator Colbeck. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Trent from Carlton in Sydney has been told by his childcare centre that they have been forced to continue charging all parents during the lockdown, regardless of whether their children are attending, because they have received no financial assistance from the Morrison government. Trent has said, it's absolutely disgusting. Why is the Morrison government refusing to provide support for childcare centres in Sydney? The Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Ayres for that question. Uh, can I uh, completely refute uh, the premise of Senator Ayres' question? This government is doing all it can to back families and the childcare sector ag uh, again during this pandemic, and we have acted swiftly to ensure appropriate mechanisms are in place. So, for example, for families, we're allowing services to waive out-of-pocket uh, costs and have extended the number of days families are allowed to keep children absent before they lose access to the childcare subsidy. For the childcare businesses themselves, the Commonwealth has partnered with the New South Wales government to facilitate swift support through JobSaver to help businesses meet payroll costs if they have experienced a 30 per cent decline in revenue. And for childcare workers, a critical workforce in our economy, which I know all of us here in this place acknowledge. Where a worker has had hours reduced, they are eligible to apply for the COVID disaster payment of up to $750 a week. Importantly, in Greater Sydney, childcare remains fully open and available to families. But we know that some families are choosing not to use care, including because of changes in their work patterns. From the 19th of July in Greater Sydney, services are allowed to waive the parents' component of the childcare fee when children are not attending. And this provides a two-fold benefit. Firstly, families benefit from the reduction in out-of-pocket costs if they are not using childcare. For example, a family on 110,000 a year using three days a week of care for two children would save $178 a week during this difficult time. And to further support families in this situation, we are also providing additional allowable absences for the duration of the lockdown period, currently until the 28th of August this year. This mechanism means families can keep children away from childcare without losing their entitlement to the subsidy because of those absences. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. One Sydney childcare provider struggling to stay afloat through the lockdown was told by the Department of Education to just stand down staff to save money. Is this the official position of the Morrison government? Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you again for the, uh, the question, and of course not. What almost a ridiculous question. This government has done everything it can last year and this year to provide support to Australian workers. Nearly $2 billion has been paid to a million Australians subject to current lockdowns. So this government is doing everything we can in the best possible Order. way to support Australian workers. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. The Morrison government has ignored pleas for support from childcare workers in the middle of a lockdown. 
and as late as last week was hounding families in Sydney's lockdown who'd received the historic childcare subsidy for debts into the thousands. Who is responsible for this decision to pursue these families struggling in the Prime Minister's lockdown in Sydney? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, I utterly reject the premise of the question. It is completely and utterly false. As I've said in the uh, primary question, we are doing everything we can for, for families with children in childcare impacted, uh, for the childcare centres themselves and for the workers. Order, Senator in Reynolds. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. The point of order, Director Nolivans, that the last supplementary actually goes to responsibility for the decision to pursue, pursue families in Sydney for debts for the childcare subsidy. I'm Senator Wong, unless I misheard, I did hear the minister disagree with that assertion. So I, I can't. Um, I will listen carefully, but I, I take it face value what I hear, and I think that answer is directly relevant. Um, Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds, to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I wasn't quite sure. What, sorry, thank you, uh, Mr. President. As I've said, I utterly reject the premise of the question. Uh, my agency, Services Australia, if there are any families, any families who are receiving benefits who are doing it tough, they can always contact Services Australia to seek relief and support. There are many measures available for families in that circumstance. And as I said in response to the primary question, we are doing absolutely everything we can to help families, to help workers and to help businesses in conjunction with the New South Wales government. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education, Senator Mackenzie. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is working to address the disparity between city and country students as highlighted in the National, Regional, Rural and Remote Higher Education Strategy? The Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator McGrath for his question. As someone who grew up in regional Queensland, he knows the challenges. And I'm sure that's why he continues to support the Isolated Children's Parents Association, who recently celebrated 50 years of advocacy for access to education for people who live, work and invest in rural and regional Australia. The Liberal and National Government know the challenges faced by regional families trying to ensure that their children receive a quality education. We know, for example, that many rural families Senator with children Watt. at both government and private boarding schools are struggling with the impact of state border closures and quarantine arrangements as a result of the latest COVID-19 pa um, pandemic breakout. As the newly appointed Minister for Regional Education, I have called an urgent meeting uh, this Friday to hear directly from parent groups and state border commissioners on how we can work together with states and territories on common sense solutions. There is more to do, Mr President. The Liberal and National Government are getting on with the job, and that is why we are committed to improving education access and quality for all Australians, no matter where they live. Since 2016, our government has invested more than $1 billion to improve high level tertiary education outcomes and opportunities for regional and remote Australians, more than any other Labor government who likes to champion their record in education, but it seems only if you live in capital cities for the Labor Party. Part of this $1 billion investment includes more than $400 million in regional measures to support the Napthine Review. The measures seek to address the disparity that has consistently existed between city and country students and provide additional investment to boost regional development and student aspiration. We know that regional students are twice as likely as metropolitan students to move to study and have lower education attainment rates, which is why we have a raft of financial support measures to assist Senator them. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. How is the government helping students in rural Australia to stay in their local regions and access higher education? Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Well, the Liberal and National Government understands that not all students can or want to move away uh, to study. The Nationals in government know that many regional students want to stay local to access higher education. Mm -hmm. and That is why, through the $74 million Regional University Centres program, which includes funding additional Commonwealth-supported places locally, 
We know that if students are educated in the regions, they're much more likely to stay in the regions. The centres provide student support services, pastoral care, study advice, support to develop writing and research skills, and essential infrastructure such as, such as study spaces, uh, video conferencing, computers and high-speed internet access. Importantly, they're community-owned and operated to respond to the specific needs of the community, like the ones in your home state, Senator McGrath in Gundawindi, Roma, St George and Dhirambandi. In 2021, the program is supporting more than 1,900 students to access higher Order. education. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. How is the government supporting students from low socioeconomic backgrounds and regional areas to reach their full potential through further educational pathways? Senator McKenzie. Yeah, thank you for another great question, Senator McGrath. It's our government that's supporting low SES students access higher education, and we're very, very proud to do it. The Napthine review identified that rural, regional and remote students from low socioeconomic backgrounds often face cumulative challenges that can make it difficult to access and complete their higher education. Data shows that these students have lower participation rates than those from major cities. Consequently, students from these backgrounds require additional focus and tailored support to help them thrive in tertiary education. That's why our government funds the Higher Education Participation and Partnership Program that plays a significant role in supporting public universities to implement strategies to improve attainment and retention outcomes targeted at those from low SES backgrounds and rural and regional areas. It is one of five measures that forms the new Indigenous Regional Low SES Attainment Fund that broadens those existing programs. Geography Order. should Senator never be a determinant for your the education. Is expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Today, 344 new cases have been reported in New South Wales, with, 30, uh, with 62 people currently in an ICU and, tragically, 34 total deaths during the current outbreak from COVID-19. The Prime Minister has said that COVID will be like the flu and that we should treat it like the flu. Does Mr Morrison stand by this statement? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Senator Colbeck, I think you might be on mute. Order on my right and left. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Sen Senator Gallagher and members of the Labor Party have a very unfortunate habit of misrepresenting what people say in the chamber, Mr. President. Uh, and Mr. President, uh, in the future, with a full vaccination program uh, and other measures to appropriately Order. manage the, the COVID-19 pandemic, it may very well be that we get to the stage where we are able to live with COVID-19 in that way, Mr. President. But I don't believe uh, that we should be verbaled by misrepresentations from the Labor Party with respect to uh, their questions in this place, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, we have all through this pandemic worked to ensure the safety of Australians. We set in place a plan very early to support um, to support Australians. We closed the borders early. We set in place plans to protect Australians. Uh, we've put in place a vaccination program that continues to roll out and grow at pace, Mr. President, and we will continue to do that. But we won't put up with negative misrepresentations and undermining of the protection of Australians by the Labor Party. We'll continue to work in the Australia in the Australian community's interests. We know because Mr Albanese has said he's only interested in fighting the government. Well, we're fighting the, we're fighting the virus. That's what we will continue to do, Mr President. We will continue to work in support of the Australian people against the pandemic. The, the Labor Party can fight whoever they please, but our focus is on the Australian people. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, Thank you. We have the quote from the Prime Minister, so we reject the uh, assertion that it's misrepresentation. Uh, My supplementary, what health advice is Mr Morrison relying on when he says that COVID will be like the flu and that we should treat it like the flu? Senator Colbeck. Again, Mr President, uh, again, my view is that M Mr Morrison's 
comments are being misrepresented by the Labor Party, as so many comments by members of the government are misrepresented by the Labor Party. Order. They've said Senator that they're Colbeck, only I have in Senator Gallagher us. on a point of order. Senator Gallagher. Point of order, uh, direct relevance. The question was around what health advice has informed those comments, not the comments themselves. Um, I think it, the minister. I, I can't instruct the minister as to how he must address a question. The minister is in order because he is challenging the premise of the question. Um, that can be debated after question time, but I don't believe he's not being relevant by um, addressing it in this fashion. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and, and, and I do believe that the, premise, the, the Prime Minister's comments are being taken out of context deliberately by the Labor Party, which they so Senator often do. Senator Wong, on a point so of order. In... Mr. President, it is not directly relevant in my submission to simply continue to cast aspersions on motivations. I, I accept in this place robust debate. Uh, what you describe as, I think, glancing reference is, how you, is the term you use. Senator Gallagher has asked a question about the health advice grounding the Prime Minister's statement made on the 2nd of July. Now, if the, if the Minister were to return to that, I think that would be consistent with the standing um, orders. I've allowed, you, I've allowed you to restate the question. However, in my view, in my view, if a minister does, he's not, I don't believe he's assigning a motive, he's making a claim about a quote being misrepresented. I don't believe that goes as far as to impugning the motive of another senator. It can be a disagreement about its context or its meaning. The minister is entitled to address that, in my view, because there was a specific quotation. Otherwise, I would be called into the or instructing ministers how to answer questions, which is not appropriate. Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, I do not accept the premise of the question. And taking a quote out of context and then applying a request for health advice to something clearly taken out of context, quite frankly, is a continuation of the dishonesty of the Labor Party in this complete debate, Mr President. So I will reject the premise of the question, Mr President, uh, and, and completely reject the assertion by the opposition uh, in, in the context of the, the, the comments that are being applied. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Mr Morrison has declared COVID would be like the flu, failed to ensure sufficient vaccine supplies and argued against lockdowns. Will he now take responsibility for the disaster unfolding in Sydney? Senator Colbeck. Mr, Pre Mr President, uh, I thank Senator Gallagher for the question. Um, the, the Prime Minister continues to provide strong leadership to this nation in the management of the COVID-19 pandemic. Whether that be from the early circumstance of closing the borders, whether that be from developing the Order. national plan for COVID, whether that be Senator uh, seeking the advice from the Doherty Senator Institute for a plan out of lockdowns. Order, Mr. Senator President, Colbeck. We will continue Senator Colbeck, please. Senator... If I ask senators to come to order, I'm going to go back to my rule to ask them to count to 10 slowly before they start breaking the rules again. I appreciate there are strong passions on this matter. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. So we will continue to provide strong leadership as a government as we manage the pandemic, and we won't accept the relentless negativity of the Labor Party as they seek to fight us rather than help us fight the pandemic. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator O'Neill. State of the people, as a senator for the great state of New South Wales, do not let this Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, who in cahoots with Gladys Berejiklian, the Premier of New South Wales, delivered the lockdown that we are all suffering. Beg your pardon, Senator Neil, please resume your seat. Senator Canavan. Small point of order, sorry, uh, Madam Senator President. I, I couldn't hear the questions that were being um, responded to. I think uh, Senator O'Neill's mic was off at the time. She mentioned that. Oh, do you want, would you start again, please? I, I'm Senator more than happy to start again, and I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question that I asked Senator Canavan. And I, and I repeat my warning. The people around Australia should not at all allow this Prime Minister, and as he did with Gladys Berejiklian and the Premier of New South Wales, um, to go O'Neill, ahead and continue please, um, please well, the government of the Senator McKenzie. Uh, Madam Deputy President, um, 
Senator O'Neill didn't ask uh, Senator Canavan a question, so we're still confused about which question and answer we're supposed to be responding to. You said, said Senator you said Senator Canavan. It words while literally New South Wales is in a lockdown never seen in the history of this country. As a senator for New South Wales, I am so disgusted with what's going on in my home state. 344 cases reported just today, 62 in ICU, 34 deaths. And I want to formally commence my acknowledgement to the civic leadership that was shown by Mr Khalil Ibrahim and his family for coming forward in the depth of their grief at the loss of their mother and father, Korkab and Hashem, to actually go on the record and deliver a health literacy message and some hope to the people of New South Wales by telling the truth about what's going on. Because you're not going to get the truth from this government in this place. They don't know how to tell it straight any day of the week. Khalil and his family, I, I send you my condolences on your great loss, and I am standing up here for our community because this government is incapable of standing up. They are incoherent in their messaging. And even the best Australians trying to do the right thing cannot get access to the very vaccines that they need to protect them. In fact, this, this poor family had Korkab uh, and Hashem waiting. To make it worse, the family discovered that Hashem and Korkab were waiting in the backlog to get their vaccination. And that is the fact. That is the fact that's facing how many of the 62 who are in ICU because they couldn't get a vaccination? How many of the 344 who were announced today as the latest people in New South Wales with COVID, how many of them couldn't get a vaccination? 34 people died, just this outbreak alone. And it's because this government didn't do its job. The incoherent messaging, perhaps very, very succinctly uh, outlined in this cartoon by Golding that describes a picture of the synchronised swimming, described as synchronised spinning by the Prime Minister. And it has an image of the Prime Minister with his hand up, raised and saying, we're at the front of the queue. The second image, we're at the back of the queue. The next image, it's not a race. The next image, oh, OK, it's a race. I'm confident New South Wales can get it done without shutting down. Oh, no, shutting down is the only way. That kind of spinning is exactly what we see in this chamber day after day, while New South Wales is confronting uh, the horror of a COVID outbreak that was entirely preventable. If the proper advice had been, had been followed. And instead, we saw the Bondi let off, we saw the gold standard pumped up by the Prime Minister, and everyone in New South Wales is failing. We have doctors in New South Wales who are telling it like it is, giving warnings that need to be heeded, but not just by the people of New South Wales who are lining up trying to get vaccines and can't even get them because this government failed to buy them when they were acquired. We have the on the record from a respiratory uh, specialist, an experienced respiratory specialist, the claim that New South Wales is suffering not just from the illness and the disease and the lack of vaccines, but from a failure of leadership. And it's that confusing messaging. In New South Wales, I'm talking to my family, I'm FaceTiming them because I can't see them, I can't be with them, we're all locked away from one another. We can't get clarity on the message. Is, is the current message, is the current strategy to lock down and eliminate the COVID? Or are we trying to vaccinate our way out of it? And the people in New South Wales have no sense, no sense of the real direction of what this government is doing. And the cost is lives. The cost is lives. I want to close my contribution to say politics does matter. The decisions of this government are having real and significant impact on the lives of people. And I want to thank particularly the heroes of this pandemic, our scientists, our doctors, our nurses, 
those in aged care, our disability workers, cleaners and other essential workers who are out there doing their best, telling the truth, not spinning it every day and failing to stand up and lead in the way that this government is now absolutely thank known you, for. Senator O'Neill, your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy <coughs> um, President. And, um, I, I too want to start my remarks by, by paying condolences to the Khalil family that Senator O'Neill mentioned. Uh, it is a, a, a personal tragedy for so many families uh, through this pandemic when, when lives are lost uh, uh, and uh, hundreds of Australians' lives have been lost uh, through what is a terrible pandemic. Before I get to the issues that Senator O'Neill raised, it is always very important for us to reflect about why why uh, we're suffering through this, this pandemic. And we must always remember that the reason this is happening, the reason people, four million people have died around the world is because of the gross cover-up of the Chinese Communist Party. They are to blame for this and they deserve condemnation constantly for their lack of ability to be upfront with the world uh, about this virus, whether or not it came from the lab, which is an open question, they certainly should be condemned for their cover-up of what they knew was going on and what has been unleashed on the world. Now, given what was unleashed on the world, this government has been upfront that not everything has gone right. Not every decision, in hindsight, is what we would have chosen to do. Uh, and we have accepted that. We, we understand that. But on any measure, this country has managed this pandemic as good, if not better, than almost every other country in the world. Most importantly, of course, people have been largely kept alive more than in other countries. We have kept largely people safe, but we have not been able to stop every fatality. No government can guarantee that. Madam Acting Deputy President, the opposition has spoken, or Senator O'Neill spoke a lot, about the, the past. And, and as I say, there are legitimate uh, criticisms to make of, of government's decisions, of responses. I don't think, though, there is any government in the world you can point to and say, that's, that's perfect. They've done everything right. Uh, uh, at these sort of times, that is an impossible, an impossible goal to achieve for, to go to it to aim for. Uh, but what we do need, of course, and what would be better from the opposition here is what do we do in the future? What do we do going forward now? And here is where the the opposition in particular is showing a distinct lack of leadership, a distinct lack of forthrightness with the Australian people, because they seem to be at least implying, Madam Acting Deputy President, the opposition is implying that somehow all we need to do is make the right decisions and everything will go away, that we'll have zero COVID, that there will be no fatalities. They are putting forward a proposal for a dreamland that does not exist. And anyone in this place, uh, anyone who thinks themselves of a leader of this nation, who propagates such myth, is no leader, is no leader, because they haven't got the guts to be up front uh, with, with the Australian people about the challenges we face and how we are going to respond to those in the months to years ahead. Because it is almost certain, almost certain, Professor Shine today uh, in the Australian Financial Review has rightly put, it's almost certain that the coronavirus, unfortunately, coming from the Chinese Communist Party, or thanks to the Chinese Communist Party, the coronavirus will be with us forever. It'll be somewhere around the world forever. And so what's the plan to deal with that? What is the plan? We cannot lock down forever. We cannot impose these massive cruel costs on the poorest in our society forever. Like Senator O'Neill, I recognise the tireless efforts of our frontline health workers. But we should also recognise the efforts of poor people in our society who have had their incomes taken away from them, their livelihoods stripped away from them, their, their ability to see and congregate with their family members, including even dying relatives, restricted from our responses to this crisis. Those things have to be considered as well. And we have to now come to a point where we do make mature decisions as a nation in responding to threats as, as severe uh, as this one that is facing us. If we fail to do that, if we fail to do that, we will divide our community. Uh, we will never get to a conclusion where we can move forward. 
uh, into some sort of manageable way of dealing with this virus from the Chinese Communist Party. But if we continue to propagate false, false hope, we will not be able to show leadership to the Australian people. We will not be able to take the, them with us and will lead to much, much worse outcomes from the coronavirus over the long term. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Ayres. Well, Senator Canavan ought to hang his head in shame. Uh, he talks about division and creating division in the community. I can't think of too many more people than Senator Canavan who've gone to great efforts to propagate misinformation, to undermine the public health message, uh, to uh, send out conspiracy theories. Him, Senator Rennick, the member for Dawson, all of them out there on the coalition backbench are undermining public health messages, making it tough for the health authorities, creating doubt in people's minds about whether the virus exists or whether the lockdown measures are appropriate, creating doubts about vaccines. Senator Canavan ought not come in here uh, unless he comes in and apologises for the damage that he has done to the national interest. The role of the National Party in this has been appalling. You know, in March, the then Minister for Regional Health told the other place Regional Australia has probably been the safest place on earth. He went on to say the rollout is about demography, not geography. So when your age group or a particular group is ready to be vaccinated, the rollout in regional Australia is exactly the same as it is in the cities. The Deputy Prime Minister told the Insiders program when asked a few weeks ago, you know, how the rollout was going out in regional Australia. He said it's going very well. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. In the, their story has been a story of complacency from the National Party and of undermining the public health messages. And what have we got now? What have we got now? Dubbo in lockdown. Dubbo in lockdown. Uh, Armidale, Tamworth, the Northern Rivers, the Hunter, all in lockdown. All of these areas, all of these regions with vaccination rates well below the national average. And while there was a chance to vaccinate regional New South Wales, the National Party were entirely focused on themselves. The Deputy Prime Minister was too busy doing the numbers in Canberra to address the rollout failures in his own electorate, which are catastrophically low. He even replaced the minister responsible for the vaccine rollout in regional Australia, not because of his failure in standing up for regional communities and delivering vaccines, but because he voted the wrong way. And then there's the Nationals member for Dawson, who's using his role in the parliament, his privileged role in this parliament, to actively spread disinformation about COVID-19 without any rebuke from the prime minister or the deputy prime minister, and egged on by extremists like Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick. And Senator Canavan himself, he published an op-ed full of half-baked calculations which would embarrass his former employer at the Productivity Commission. He said that the public health measures were too expensive. He since tweeted, yes, Delta is more transmissible, but it is less deadly, so we don't need to lock down in the lockdowns. Well, you can be sure of one thing. Senator Canavan will never have to attend a hospital bed and intubate a seriously ill patient. He will never have to clean a patient who is in a coma. He will never have to talk to the grieving relatives of a patient of COVID-19 who has died. He will continue to just propagate his keyboard warrior theories and promote disinformation and division within the Australian community, and he ought to be ashamed of himself. The result of all of this division and all of this complacency is more lockdowns, extending their reach in a regional Australia where the health outcomes have always been worse. The result of, uh, of a, the no lockdown approach of Senator Canavan would be Regional hospitals overwhelmed, more deaths, more disabilities. He is a propagator of a COVID-19 death cult and he ought to stop. 
uh, the member for Dolson ought to stop. Senator Rennick ought to stop. And the Prime Minister should actually have the courage to stand up to them, to rebuke them publicly, and to send out a, for once a clear and coherent public health message and do the job that this Prime Minister is supposed to have done, deliver vaccines Senator for Australia. Ayers, your time has expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. It's my honour to serve the Senate and through it my constituents as the Deputy Chair of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19. And thinking back a year ago when that committee was established in the early stages of the pandemic, I remember quite well the bipartisan spirit in which it was established. It was proposed through this chamber on a unanimous basis and its early work in particular, led by Senator Gallagher, uh, was admirably bipartisan. Unfortunately, I think what's happened over time is that pressure has been brought to bear on that committee and on Labor MPs and senators to walk away from the bipartisan spirit in which the early response to COVID-19 was characterised by and to seek to make partisan opportunities from the pandemic. I was listening very carefully to the contributions of Senator O'Neill and Senator Ayres, and I have a lot of empathy for them as New South Wales senators uh, for what they, their families and their constituents are going through. But in listening to their contributions, I couldn't decide whether their memories were just short, so short that they were short like a goldfish, or just selective. Because in Senator O'Neill's contribution, she said the lockdown in New South Wales is something that has never before been seen in the history of this country. With Senator O'Neill, when the restrictions lift in New South Wales, as I hope they soon do, when the border closures soon come to an end, I encourage you to come to Melbourne and try and tell Victorians that the lockdown that New South Wales underwent has never before been seen in the history of this country. I think you might be interested by the response you get. Because, of course, Victorians remember the very long 111-day lockdown that they endured. And I hope that New South Wales does not have to suffer what Victorians suffered. Labor senators throughout question time talked about the 34 very tragic deaths that have occurred so far in the outbreak in New, in New South Wales. And indeed, they are tragic, and indeed, that is 34 deaths more than any Australian would like to see. Unfortunately, it, help, it makes me recall the more than 800 deaths that occurred in Victoria last year in our lockdown. Sadly, we have been here before. Senator O'Neill, uh, Senator Ayres, I apologise, in his contribution talked about the misinformation uh, that have been contributed in this debate. And yet, curiously omitted from his uh, attacks on uh, some others in this place was any criticism of his own colleagues and the way in which they've contributed to misinformation in this debate. He could have talked about the misinformation that his own leader, Mr Albanese, has fuelled, uh, particularly the scepticism around the AstraZeneca vaccine, and the way in which Mr Albanese has not been able to bring himself to endorse what we know is a safe and effective vaccine approved by our Therapeutic Goods Administration. He could have thought about his own New South Wales colleague, Mr Husick, a shadow minister, who in his own instance of misinformation a few weeks ago said that Australia did not have any sovereign domestic vaccine manufacturing capability. Uh, I hope it was just an error and not an outright lie, but it was, uh, either way it was a case of misinformation. He could have thought about the Labor Party's hand-picked candidate in Higgins, who on her social media pages like Twitter and on an episode of Q&A has baselessly undermined the effectiveness of the AstraZeneca vaccine in a way that is very dangerous given the millions of doses we have of that vaccine and given the domestic manufacturing capacity we have of that vaccine. We know from the modelling released by the Peter Doherty Institute just a few weeks ago that there is a statistical, it's statistically insignificant difference between the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, and yet we've seen repeatedly uh, significant hesitation in our community to take the AstraZeneca vaccine because of the way in which it's been undermined. They could have instead taken the route of some of their more responsible colleagues. I, I pay tribute to the member for Maranong, Mr Shorten, who visited the AstraZeneca facility uh, in Melbourne, the CSL facility, and congratulated the workers for the amazing work that they're doing producing an Australian-made vaccine to this virus. Or Senator Choney in this place, who's equally promoted AstraZeneca and encouraged his constituents to take it up. Or Mr Bowen in the other place, who's equally encouraged them to take it up. 
Finally, though, I have to say I was surprised by my friend Senator Gallagher's question uh, in the final question in question time today, because it seems to me that she's not familiar with the roadmap agreed to by the National Cabinet, by all state premiers and the Prime Minister, and the final phase of which, when we hopefully get to those higher rates of vaccination, is manage COVID-19 as an infectious disease like any other in the community. That's the world that all Australians aspire to. That's the world that we should be striving to, and we should do so on Thank a bipartisan you, Senator basis. Patterson, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. And I uh, rise to answer to um, ask my comment and take note of Senator Birmingham's uh, responses to questions. Look, here in New South Wales today, we've seen another 344 new COVID-19 cases. There are currently 374 people in hospital and 62 people in intensive care. 34 deaths, which means that we should be actually, our hearts should be going out to those that have lost these loved ones. But we have a defence from the government in this uh, taking note that it's either one case from the National Senator, he says it's Trump like, it's, the defence says it was China's fault. So let's not hold anyone else to account. And then uh, just uh, previous to me, the senator made comments that we should not question the failings of the government. Well, it is the responsibility, but for us to be questioning what the government is doing with this lockdown, it is critically important that a spotlight and disinfectant be put on what the government's actually performing and how they're performing. It is in the national interest to make sure that we do get proper answers uh, unlike what we've been seeing through uh, question time. Now, we're nearly two months into lockdown here in Greater Sydney, and unfortunately, we're seeing other parts of the state join in. The Hunter Valley, New England, the Byron Shire, the Richmond Valley, Lismore, Ballina Shire, and now Tamworth and Dubbo. Case numbers are continuing to head in the wrong direction. Yesterday, the Sydney Morning Herald published a powerful opinion piece from Western Sydney doctor who is gravely concerned about the situation in Western and Southwestern Sydney. The doctor said, and I quote, New South Wales is almost on the precip of a massive deterioration. Contact traces are overwhelmed with reporting of infection hotspots lagging by days. The whole strategy of relying on contract tracing for infection control is failing or indeed has failed. This very brave whistleblower has spoken out. We've got to be asking questions about where we're up to in the fight against COVID-19. Of course, this is the, the specialist from uh, Western Sydney uh, has also given us a stark warning on what the situation is on the ground here in Sydney and how did it come to this. Now, there are some obvious failings. This is a botched vaccine rollout that Morrison said isn't a race. Mr. Morrison, there is the failure to set up a national quarantine system, which has seen a leak from hotel quarantine on average every nine days. There is the failure to supply vaccines to pharmacies, where just 25% of authorised pharmacies are now putting uh, jabs into arms. This, there is the failure of the Morrison government to stop its own members of parliament from spreading outrageous misinformation. Let's just want to go to another brave whistleblower, um, the time I have left at Sydney Airport, and has spoken about how the drivers are now in the entire country were let down by lazy and negligent processes. And particularly when we then turn to the poor limo driver who was being singled out and ostracised for being patient zero in the latest outbreak. Now, buses there, are, passenger buses there, are used to transport international arrivals to hotel quarantine. They are cleaned comprehensively by cleaners in full PPE between every single trip at the airport. That's best practice. The Australian Defence Force has been brought in to load luggage in these buses in a COVID safe manner. This is best practice. But for the international crew on passenger or freight flights, none of these systems are in place. The vehicle used to transport crew from the airport to the hotel are not cleaned. They're not cleaned at the airport. They're not cleaned between trips. 
If a crew member with COVID sits in one of these minivans, then every other crew member who sits in the vehicle for the rest of the day, or even days later, is stepping into a viral bomb. And the Australian Defence Force doesn't load bags, and only does 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 not only load bags into these vehicles. Um, well, the drivers are forced to do everything themselves, whilst these bags aren't being loaded appropriately by defence personnel without. PPE, PPE, except maybe a face mask. Now, how's that happening? It's happening because of government inaction and incompetence. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator O'Neill to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Senator Thorpe. Oh, do you need to put the question oh, for her? I, I seek leave. Sorry, I beg your pardon, Deputy President. I um, You're moving. seek leave, moving to take note of the answers um, on behalf of Senate of the answers to her question on behalf of Senator Thorpe. And that was Thorpe to Senator Birmingham, I think. Yes, uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the minister's answers to my questions on the closing the gap agreement. It's probably better to say that I rise to take note of the minister's failure to provide an answer. Every year, every time the government stands up to apologise for its failures, promising to do better next time and then failing again. There's no bigger proof of this government's failures and complete lack of ambition than the justice targets in the Closing the Gap report. The target to end the over-imprisonment of our young people by 30% in 10 years and our adults by 15% in 10 years is a joke. It means that we won't achieve parity on imprisonment rates until 2093. Yes, 2093. We need to see change in our lifetime, surely. So, right. Our communities want stronger, more ambitious justice targets that would end our over-imprisonment of our people urgently. It's an urgent matter for us, right? I know it's not an urgent matter for you fellas in there, but we're dying waiting. Rather than the unacceptable proposal of achieving parity in 71 years and going by our, uh, um, our rate of our lifetime rate, not even my daughter, my 13 year old daughter will see that. Strong ambitious justice targets will save lives. In the 30 years since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, 500 of us have died at the hands of the criminal racist legal system. Going by that indicator alone, we can expect well over 1,000 deaths in custody by 2093. So lots to look forward to, right? Lots to be happy about as a black fella in this country today. What the minister was saying in this chamber earlier is that the Morrison government is okay with that number. You know, let's have a shandy or let's go to our privileged places and all feel good about that. Well, we don't. And we're dying on your watch. Our communities cannot mourn more deaths in custody. We must see changes in our lifetime. And we demand it. The solutions to all of these problems that we did not create, remember, we didn't create this. Black fellas aren't the issue in this country. The government is the issue in this country, not us. We're not an issue. Don't call it black issues, indigenous issues. We're not the issue. We need to be in the driver's seat. We need to self-determine our own destiny. We are hurt by the Morrison government imposing top-down policies like the mission manager did in the old days, making decisions for us, thinking that they know best, you know, we'll steal the children because they'll be better off in a white family. We know what that's like. We're sick of that. We don't want to live like that no more. Our people have been managing our own affairs for thousands of years. We must be in charge of our destiny again. It's called self-determination. When decisions are in our hands, our solutions work and we take care of our communities. 
Blackfellas culture is about caring for everyone. No one will miss out. We modelled this in setting up the nation's first Aboriginal legal services and Aboriginal health services. My grandmother was part of setting up the first Aboriginal health service in Victoria in the late 60s. That's self-determination. You know why? Because the white doctors, the white services wouldn't even let us in the door to seek health care. So we had to do it ourselves, and it worked because it was community controlled and it was self-determined. We need a treaty. We need to sit down and negotiate how we can bring this nation forward. The only way we're going to truly mature as a nation and bring everybody together, libs, labs, everybody, is to negotiate a treaty. We are only we're only one of a few Commonwealth countries in the world that doesn't have a treaty with its first people. Come on. Let's move together. Let's heal together. And let's treaty together. Let's negotiate the settlement of this country because it has never been settled and we have not ceded our sovereignty. Thank you. The question is the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices?